Father, Lord, Lord, as we come into your house tonight, Lord Jesus, Lord, we come with expecting hearts, Lord Jesus, God, Lord, we're just so grateful and honored to be here tonight, Lord Jesus, once again, Lord, thank you for your traveling mercy, Lord Jesus, God, bringing us here tonight, Lord, Lord, as long as the doors are open, Lord Jesus, as long as, Lord, there's a Lord, another truth, Lord, we can receive from you, Lord. I want to be here, Lord Jesus. God, reveal yourself to us tonight, Lord Jesus. Open up your heart to us, God. We want to see it, Lord Jesus, more clearly, God. We don't want to leave here the same way, Lord, we came, God, but change us from glory to glory to glory tonight, Lord Jesus. We love you, Lord, and we thank you, God. We give you this service, Lord, as we just give it to you, Lord. We lift our hands to you, Lord, and worship. Lord, we sing to you and worship, Lord. We live for you and worship, Lord God. We love you and we thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. It's good to be here tonight. Are you guys happy? Is everyone happy tonight? Why don't you just, uh, you don't have to shake each other's hand, but you can look to someone and just wave at them and say, God bless you. How about that? Just wave at someone tonight. I know it's not the same, is it? It's not the same. <laughs> it's not the same. But God's good. He is good. He's brought us. I'm just glad that, you know, he's bringing the healings and, you know, people are recovering from this illness here. So he's still our healer. He's still our provider. Amen. That doesn't change. Amen. He's the same God. We'll sing that song tonight. The same God who spoke to the woman at the well. Yep. The same God who spoke to all the women at the well. The same God whose wonders too many to tell. The same God who parted the raging Red Sea. Hallelujah. Lord, he's the same God who created 
to you. Amen. Over and over he has. Praise God. You may be seated tonight. Amen. Let's go to key of, uh, um, let's try A flat. He's been faithful, faithful to me. love and mercy I see though in my heart I have questioned even failed to believe but he's been faithful so tonight. He's been faithful. He's been faithful. So faithful to me. Oh, looking back, his love and mercy I see. First verse, in my moments of fear, through every pain and every tear, oh, there's a God who's been faithful to me. Can you testify of that tonight? Oh, yes. Oh. 
Request tonight. Okay, perfect. Perfect, perfect. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for being so faithful. Amen. We, we, when we weren't there, He was always there. Amen. Seeking us out, drawing us back. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. We have a couple of prayer requests. One for Nessa, that she regains all of her strength and full recovery from the sickness. And for Sister Elizabeth Murphy and Joel C. for complete healing from their cancer. Also have prayer requests for Sherry for sinuses, Abby Galusha for sickness, Andy Thompson recovering from surgery, Lois from heart surgery, Melissa for ankle surgery, and Sister Jane for sickness. Anybody have unspoken prayer requests? Let's live before the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time, Lord Jesus. We thank you for healing us, Lord. We thank you for your grace and your mercy, Lord. 
Lord, we ask that you just heal these names, Lord. Heal these people. Touch them, Lord, in Jesus' name. Be with Nessa, Lord. Be with Sherry, Lord. Lord, everyone, just touch them, Lord Jesus. Come into our lives, Lord, and help us with every situation. Open our hearts to the service tonight, Lord. Let us pull what we need, Lord. Lord, let us leave anything that hinders us outside. Open our hearts, Lord Jesus. Lord, we just ask for all the unspoken prayer requests that you just work in every situation, Lord. Help them, Lord. Let people see you, Lord, the real you, Lord. Let them understand who you are, Lord Jesus. We pray everything in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I was telling uh, oh, my dad and brother Rap in the back. Um, I just got done with my six 12 in a row shifts at night. So uh, I'm tired in body, but it, it was good. God was good. He gave me some good patience, and I got through it just fine. But um, last night, one of the nurses came up to me, and he was like, do you need a cigarette? Do you need, like, are you okay? You need a cigarette? Do you need, like, an Ativan or, like, something? Not an Ativan, but, uh, you know, one of those antidepressants. That's who he was asking. Antidepressants. And I was like, no, I'm good. I'm good. He's like, what I really need is this right here tonight. I need this. See, with his presence, in his presence, that lets off the pressure. Amen? And I can testify that every time I feel stressed, every time I feel a little tired in body, that presence of the Lord, you get in at one time, and you can just feel the release. Amen? So I, so I just praise the Lord for, amen, giving me that, that satisfaction. Amen? His satisfaction and not the world's substitute. Amen? So I, I just thank God for that, amen. He, he provides it, amen, and it's open to all, amen. Praise the Lord. So let's just sing, um, let's just sing a few, just a, just a song here as Brother Rap comes, amen. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. We'll sing it. There's nothing worth more. Give me a key, because that was, that, was, that was off. There's nothing worth more. That could ever come close No thing can compare You're our living hope Your presence, Lord Why don't you just ask Him to come in right now? Holy Spirit, you're welcome Oh, Holy Spirit sing it all.
have so much to be thankful for. We don't want to take God's presence or his blessing for granted, and we surely, we surely don't do that. Well, God bless you all. Uh, good to be back, and uh, I'm glad to see that we're not the only family on the men that gradually uh, we're getting better. Perhaps we can open our Bibles to Revelation chapter 3, and uh, we'll, we're going to talk again, uh, speak again from Revelation 3 on the uh, seventh church age, allowed to say in church age, and looking at the themes of repentance and, uh, and restoration, and uh, this may very well be the, uh, the last part in this, uh, in this series, and I thank you all for your, uh, for your patience for the last, uh, last uh, I think, year and a half or so. It's been a while, but uh, it's been a real, been a real blessing for, for me personally. But uh, we'll just start here from verse, verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Because you say I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And know not that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And that uh, verse 17 is where we're going to kind of focus uh, um, for the first part this evening. Lord willing, we'll get through uh, uh, the rest of this as well this evening. But let's just uh, take this to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for your goodness and your grace, Father. Lord, as we read the description of the, uh, of, of the church age in which we've been uh, grown up and, and, and born in, we can be so thankful, Lord, that we've heard a call to, out, to come out of that and come into a personal uh, walk with you that's so much richer than an organizational walk. Lord, we just, uh, we're very grateful for this message, Lord, that, uh, that you've put something into our hearts to hear so that we can walk personally with you, O oh God. Lord, I just pray that you would uh, anoint my words this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord bless you. you may be seated. So last, uh, um, I think we've been, before, uh, last year in December, uh, last service, we were looking at the Laodicean church and we noted uh, four different ways it was described through the um, description as, in, as we found it in Revelation 3.14. The first thing that God says, um, he knows them, um, he actually he doesn't say he knows them, he knows their works. They're the busy church. They're doing all kinds of things and is, uh, is something that is good enough for them. And uh, God knew their works, but he never knew them. And that's something we want to be careful that we're not going to get caught up into, that we want to make sure that God knows us, that we know God, and it's not just that we're not just busy doing good things. Because I tell you, you can, be, you can be so busy, you can be preparing sermons, you can be preparing Bible lessons and things like that, but that's not the same as being quiet for the Lord for yourself. And you can be busy doing all these good things on the inside, you can feel like you're in a there's nothing there, there any. And then the next thing that we notice about them, um, the scripture says that they're a lukewarm church. And it wasn't just the idea of temperature. They really spoke to me when I, for the last service, they weren't really interested in living the truth. They were just interested in debating the truth. And you have to be interested in doing more than talking about it. Because talking is very, very easy. Um, you're really committed to something. You can be skeptical. You can find fault in things. But when you're really living it, and determined to live it, that is, uh, that is not lukewarm. That is, that, that's rare. And last, uh, the third thing I noticed, um, it's the talking church. It's the only church age whose own words are being recorded. And they're saying, God, I've done this. I've done that. I've done all these other things. And almost like, it's me, it's me, it's me. Oh, Lord, look at all I've done. They're not asking God to do anything because they don't feel that they need anything. And uh, it's, it's, the, it's the talking church, and we want to make sure that we're not just talking to God, but we're actually being still and, and listening. That's right. And lastly, we saw that they were the desensitized church, because we saw that they, um, they no, that's what we'll do our best here. The desensitized church, because they're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, and don't know it. 
And that was just the, uh, the, the, the image of the leper who has this nerve disease. And they don't, re- and what, 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 what a gift it is to be able to feel and sense pain because pain protects us from what we, how we could be hurting ourselves much, much more. And this desensitized church, this, this condition gradually built up and they didn't realize how what they were getting into that brought so much pleasure to their flesh was actually harming them. And uh, um, you'll see that um, Brother Gideon was talking about how he was blessed this last night uh, in his night shift with good patience. Not all patients are good, from what I hear from my doctor family. And um, the Laodicean church is not really a good patient. They're... Uh, the doctor comes and uh, they know what uh, they think they need. It's kind of like you go to the doctor and say, doctor, these are the medicines I'm going to take. You tell me what I have that this will work with. But when we go to the doctor, when we go to God, we need to be willing to listen to what God's diagnosis is. Because here you've got in Revelation 3 verse 17, I'm seeing two dueling diagnoses. I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy. Um, I'm stressed. God, can you give me something like Gideon said? Can you give me a pill to help me? You don't realize there might be a much deeper issue involved in God's diagnosis. It isn't just that you're busy. God's diagnosis is you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. And that's not a message that any of us want to hear, much less is allowed to say in church. So this evening I want to start on just looking at what God's diagnosis of this church was. Because like Brother Branham says, what God saw was entirely different from what they said they saw. They see the glittering buildings. They see the increasing numbers of everything. And their data looks like their church is growing. But God doesn't count his church. He weighs his church. He's looking for quality, not quantity. They thought they were rich in goods and spiritually healthy, that they had arrived, that they needed nothing. But God saw it otherwise. And I just want to take a few minutes this evening and go over some of these uh, really negative adjectives. God is not using very um, woke language. He's using somewhat offensive language. He's not making anybody feel good with his diagnosis. But a good mechanic, a good doctor isn't into making you feel good. He's into making you be good. He's, making, he's willing to tell you, hey, your car is rotten. You need some serious work done. That's what you want to have told to you if that's what the case is. And God's going to tell them some tough things. The first thing that God says to him is, you, you don't realize it, but you're in a wretched condition. You've been able to cover it up with all kinds of things, but you find yourself in a wretched condition. And on page 396 of the Church Age book, Brother Branham says it's, it points to the irony. In this age of plenty and opportunity, suddenly we find mental illness taking such a toll as to alarm the nation. And um, some of the things that, I mean, chickens are gradually coming home to to roost because in the the 60s and 70s, you have the sexual revolution, you have feminism, you should be able to live your life however you want to, don't get married, just, just, just live your life as you want to. And now one of the results of this, you have the United Kingdom, you have the United States, they have a, a minister for loneliness because people wanted to live their life as they wanted to live in their young years. And then you get older and you're, you're alone. And you've got all these, all these health problems because of it. Well, it's because you were, you, you were choosing a selfish way for a really long time. It's not easy raising kids. And then you did what you wanted to do for many, many years. And now you're just lonely. But uh, they've got everybody here, here in the world today. Everybody ought to be happy. In the United States, we have, we're, this is, we've got a lot of blessing here. And I remember going, when I was at, at, at college, I'd go into, the, uh, go into the cafeteria. I was thrilled. It was already, food was made for me. It was paid for. I just got, and people are walking around like, there's nothing to eat. I'm not going to eat this. I, there's, we, we're, we're, we're blessed. But in this place, still millions are taking sedatives at night. Pet pills in the morning, rushing to doctors, entering institutions, trying to drown out unknown fears by alcohol, all these things when we're so blessed. Yeah, we're having, but there's something inside, there's a voice that, you, that, that cannot be drowned out. 
There's a hunger that cannot be satisfied with any other thing. Yet the devil wants to distract you from that. We'll talk more about that late, later. It's a, it's, 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 it's a wretched condition that they find themselves in. This age, at the bottom of page one, they boast themselves of tremendous stores of worldly goods, but people are less happy than ever. After Christmas, everybody's got the things on their Christmas list, and my kids are already updating their Amazon list. We just got all things that was on there, then you're already. It's like, what are, yeah, Lord, help us. My goodness. Um, sorry, Job. But uh, um, bottom of page two, without a known reason, men's hearts are failing for fear. The world is so dark in this age could well be called the age of neurotics. It boasts, but it can't back it up. And you notice it's, you, got the, uh, you, have the, you have the bully there in the school. He, he's he all the boasting. When somebody finally calls his boast, then he backs down he, and you realize he, 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 he doesn't have the goods. And that's what you find this age also having. We, we make all kinds of boasts. We think we can live this, live that. But when, if, you, if you don't have the Lord, you really can't do half what you think you can. You need that on the inside. And like the, um, the Old Testament talks about, we have peace, peace, but there is no peace. That's what all the worldly philosophies promise. They promise all kinds of wonderful things, but there is no peace there in the end. And the church is not just wretched, they're, they're miserable. Brother Branham says that means that they're objects to be pitied. They're, they're full of pride. Um, they, they've built upon quicksand rather than upon the rock of the revelation of God's word. And we know soon cometh the earthquake. It says, pity the poor people who are in this last day ecumenical move. And call it the move of God when it's actually the move of Satan. And it's pitiable because they've got their, the hopes are so high. Expectation is so high. And then in the end, a minister fails or something else fails. And there's not the enduring power and the keeping power. I was telling Brother Paul earlier this uh, week, I read in the uh, news and the, the BBC was been following a particular uh, big healing ministry in Africa. And I can remember when my brother left the message some years ago, we were saying, yeah, you've got, Brother Branham has got signs and wonders, but there are many better, even greater signs and wonders being done by this particular healer in Africa. And he, and he traded the one for the other. And the news came out, this big healer in Africa, he has been committing all kinds of... Uh, um, sexual abuse and things like that. And I thought, man, the more, that, the longer time passes, the more extraordinary the prophet actually becomes because he had so many signs and wonders. And yet by God's grace, he kept his feet on the ground. He was humble. He lived a clean life. That's extraordinary. And you can, and, and, but you've got this, this worldly church, part of the ecumenical move, and they, they set their heights on all these other things. And this is a disappointment when it happens here, but it's even a greater disappointment when you get to the other side and think, ah, oh, Lord, Lord, I've all these great things, but the Lord says, I never knew you. And that is a, that is a pitiable disappointment. And it can be difficult even when, when people can come into, sometimes there'll be perfect storms created in, in, in our lives where we can have difficult circumstances and then maybe we're dissatisfied with something in the church or something in the message and then because we, we just feel like there's really no good place to turn anywhere. And that's where we really just have to be watching our, our um, like a uh, pilot to watch his, his dashboard, his instruments, so you just stay flying straight, straight, just fly by the instruments because those perfect storms can come up and you can think, man, these other big churches, they've got the great worship team, they've got the great uh, charismatic uh, gifts being poured out and they've got huge amounts of people coming, they, they care about the community, the community is receiving something from them and you can think, man, how does that compare with my church? And you, when, you, when that perfect storm gets created, like, man, I need, I need to try going somewhere else because maybe I didn't have everything I thought I had. And I think Brother Brandon, he makes a point here, pity them, don't envy them. Because it can look, um, it, fool's gold can glitter. They can look so wonderful. But he calls us back, back to the old store buildings, back to the dimly lit rooms, back to the cellars, back to less of the world and more of God. And that's what we need. We don't want to become so polished that there's no room to just have a 
have a, have, have a, have a, have a, just a great repentance there at the altar. Who cares what people think? Let's just, let's just keep it simple. Have God move because that's what it's about. And God's blessed us with the, with, with, with the great building, but that's not the point. We come here just, it's wonderful. We can host all kinds of things, but the point is that God can move in here and he can move in our hearts. And that's what, what, what we want. Because if it's, if it's all, all about the buildings, earthquake will destroy the building. It'll burn up and there's nothing left over. But if it's about the heart, that'll abide forever. And that's what we're here for. Poor. Now, of course, Brother Pam says this means spiritually poor, because uh, one thing the, uh, the worldly church is not is it is not financially poor. They've got business managers, they've got all kinds of things. But he says this is the spiritually poor. And I just, I, I just was really blessed going through these adjectives, going through the church age book. Brother Pam writes a lot in there. I just tried to clip out some highlights, but there's more in the notes. But the sign of this age as it closes is bigger and better churches more and more people with more and more manifestation of what's supposed to be demonstrations of the Holy Ghost. And you can find some huge churches. You can find with lots of people. And you think, man, what are we doing wrong? We're not doing anything wrong. But don't get distracted by what's going on outside. He says, the filled altars, the gifts of the Spirit in operation, the remarkable attendance is not the answer from God. For those who come to the altars, very seldom say to go on with God. It's changed lives that last. And it's not just putting your name on a roll, becoming part of a small group Bible study, but you're actually being transformed. You, your family from the inside out. And it, it's so important uh, to catch the vision for the time that we're living in. To see that, hey, the revival swept the land in 1956. They're in, the, they're in those, uh, those revivals back and forth. And we still pray that God will continue to move. But our expectation isn't for this big work of God. So when we see that kind of thing happening, we don't think, oh, yeah, that's what I want to be part of. We, we know, we, that time has come. We pray for this to work in our hearts. We pray for him to work locally. But we have, it helps us to have discernment. That's why God gives us the message so that we can, we can capitalize on it and we can see what the characteristics of the true vine are, what the characteristics of the false vine are, so that we won't be easily so led astray and envious. Why, why can't we have a, a huge outreach where everybody just pours in? Um, it's easy to have everybody pour in when you say, come to the altar just as you are and leave just as you were. But when there's change involved, that's a much higher expectation. So these people, continuing on here with that dot, 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 um, where all those who came down the aisle, they might have heard a man, listened to an appeal. They came into the net, but they were not fish. And he says, turtle-like, they crawled back to their own waters. So yes, when you, when, when, when you throw the gospel net, it can get all, Jesus tells us in the Matthew 13, the parables of the kingdom, you can get all kinds of creatures coming in the net. And at the end, when you get back to shore, you, you, you throw the turtles out, you throw the crawdads out, and you keep the fish. So it's not just what the heavy net, it's what's in the net. And he also quotes then about uh, in the last days, um, many will come to the Lord at the judgment and say, didn't we do many more wonderful works in your name, even to the casting out devils? And Jesus says, um, depart from you that work iniquity. I never knew you. You that work iniquity. That's, that, those are strong words. He called them workers of iniquity, yet you can get a man that can come and pray for the sick, get oil and blood appearing in the congregation, prophecy coming forth, and all manner of the supernatural, and people will gather around him and swear he's of the Lord, even though he's actually making a money racket of religion and living in sin. And that's what you often see, and it's just, it's remarkable um, and Brother Brandon's ministry, you didn't have that. Because when you have the, your ministry is being blessed, and then people's tendency is going to be to put you on a pedestal, that, is a, that can be a, 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 a trap. And many fall into that. Um, and that's what we just read in the news about. But um, the only answer 
they have is the absolutely unbiblical answer. Well, he gets results, so he must be of God. That's not it. It's not the man. It, 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 you have to take it back to the word. This sounds so good. Oh, he gets results. Look at what's, what, 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 at what's happening. But how actually poor this age is in the spirit of God. And the poor, poverty-stricken ones don't even know it. That's what Revelation 3 says. And knoweth it not. Because you seem it. You have all kinds of, of seeming manifestation. Seeming results. But how much of it will actually... The Apostle Paul, I think, in First or Second Corinthians, talks about the, um, the foundation. That is solid. But what you build upon that foundation, wood, hay, stubble, that will be burned up. What are you going to build upon the foundation... And what we want to be make sure we're, we're building things on our that foundation of grace that's going to stand the test. Then the last characteristic, of these offensive terms that God uses here to to, uh, to to wake us up, He says, "You're blind and naked," and uh, He talks about how these who are are they who have become blind because they've refused the word of God. They've stripped themselves naked by leaving God's care and protection. They seek to build their own way of salvation. And that is how it's been since the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve, when they fell onto sin, the first thing they did, they realized they were naked and they got fig leaves. They thought they were covered. But God's message was to them, you're still naked. They were covered with fig leaves. And God said, who told you you're naked? They said, we're not naked, we're covered. You're, you're not covered if it's your own righteousness that covers you. And every single man-made religion is always going to be giving us a covering by our own righteousness, and it's always going to be a case of the emperor's new clothes. We're so impressed with how, how, how good it looks, but it covers nothing. And um, talking about, about nakedness, this is the same experience that the children of Israel had there by Mount Sinai. When Moses came off the mountain... And the people, Aaron had built this golden calf. And the people were, were partying around the calf. And Moses saw the people that they were naked. And the Bible says Aaron had made them naked under their shame among their enemies. How did he make them naked? He wasn't going out there stripping off their clothes. But he removed God's word from them. They had, they, just like the last sentence said, they left God's care and protection. They're building their own way of salvation. When you leave God's care and protection, you're, you're, you're leaving your garments behind. And you are naked. And it's not just naked as far as immodest, but you're also exposed to the elements. There's nothing to protect you. All of that is there, is there included. And uh, he says, oh, how lovely and beautiful dressed they can appear in their own eyes as they form their general assemblies, their councils, etc. But now God is stripping it all away. And they're naked. He's revealing the nakedness. For these organizations have but led them into the camp of Antichrist, into the field of tares, right up to their binding and burning. And he repeats again, objects of pity indeed they are. Pity them, warn them, beseech them, and still they can go their way headlong into destruction. But um, we've, got the, we've got the diagnosis, and it's not a good diagnosis. And it's even worse when you've got a patient who's not willing to hear it. But the doctor has the responsibility. I've got to tell them. He tells them. Then the doctor goes on and he gives a, um, he gives a prescription. And when it's, take a, a few minutes and looking at what God's prescription was in verses 18 and 19. We notice he doesn't go and give them a list of things to do. He doesn't hand them a book. Uh, the seven habits of highly effective Christians. He doesn't do that. The, what he, uh, we'll just read it. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich. And it suggests that these are, the, 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 these, what he's suggesting that they acquire or buy, we'll look at them as, as, as symbols, because they have enough gold. What is the gold that God's talking about here? And also buy of me white raiment that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness not appear, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. And I want to look, the way I was looking at this last night, verses 18 and 19, they work really, really well together. Verse 18 is basically 
a picture or an illustration that's a little more lengthy. And verse 19 gives it short, sweet, and to the point. You need to repent. That's verse 19. Verse 18 shows us what repentance actually looks like. What does repentance actually include? It breaks it down uh, really, really well. First off, God's prescription, he says, buy of me. For the loud to say in church, if somebody comes to them needing help, they will give them, sign them up for this program, that program, give them all kinds of things to do. But God tells them, come to me. Buy of me. He points us to himself. And that is, that's the most, I thought that was really, uh, really noteworthy where the Brandon pointed that out. He directs this last day church to one hope, and that hope is himself. He says, come to me and buy. And it's evident, he says, from this phrase, buy of me, that the Laodicean church is not at all dealing with Jesus for the spiritual products of the kingdom of God. Their transactions cannot be spiritual. They've been doing all these kinds of things, but they've not been dealing with Christ. Because now he's saying, come back to me and buy. They've been doing all kinds of things. This is at the top of page four. But if they've been, if they've been dealing with Christ, we've already gotten this. But they're not. Because this, the loud to say in church isn't Christ's church anymore. All the way back in the Pergamian church. This says Satan sits enthroned upon the church. And it, it, it's his church. And Christ has finally been pushed outside the church. So when they're busy, and this is the greatest deception. It's like Satan has hacked the church. He's hacked everything about it. They think they're accessing Christ. They think they're getting something from Christ, but it's the greatest deception because he is outside the church, and they're so busy. He's turning the music up so high, getting them doing so many things. They can't even hear the knock, knock, knock. And even if they could hear, they couldn't hear the voice because Satan doesn't want you to buy of him because really, all Christ says, come to me, my yoke is easy, my burden is light, and you'll find true rest to your souls. Their transactions cannot have been spiritual. You may think they're spiritual, but how can they be? The works in their midst are definitely not, as Paul would say, God in you, willing and doing of his good pleasure. So what about all these churches, schools, hospitals, missionary ventures, etc.? God's not in them as long as they're denominational seed and spirit and not the seed and spirit of God. They can be doing all kinds of really good humanitarian things. And it's, that, 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 those can be great things to do, but don't deceive somebody thinking that they're also getting saved because those are two different things. The gold of God, Brother Branham says, the gold of God is Christ-like character produced in the furnace of affliction. Brother Branham says, these people had plenty of gold. It was the wrong kind. It was that gold that bought men's lives and destroyed them. It was the gold that warped and twisted human character. For its love was the root of all evil. The gift of the gold of God is a Christ-like character produced in the furnace of affliction. This age is designed to get us to avoid affliction does not want us to have any kind of affliction at all. This morning in Bible class, we were going over Paul's uh, missionary journey uh, to Philippi. And you know, at the beginning of the day, Paul might have prayed, like many of us will pray in the mornings, Lord, please bless this day and help it to be a good day. In Jesus' name, amen. That seems like a really good prayer. But God's idea of a good day and your idea of a good day could be very, very different. When we say, Lord, please help me have a good day, we're really probably meaning a pain-free day. That's what we're asking for. That is not necessarily God's will for us because 1 Thessalonians 4 says that God's will is our sanctification. That's God's will. That's what God probably cares about. Definitely, he cares more about our sanctification than us getting a particular kind of car, a particular kind of house, a particular kind of job. We pray about those things. But we should also be praying about, Lord, help me to grow in sanctification more in your Christ-likeness. So Paul had been praying for weeks, Lord, where would you have me to preach? Where would you have me to go? And he tries to go up into Bithynia and to Asia and Mysia and everywhere that says the Holy Ghost suffered him not to go there. I think, man... 
anybody is being led by the Spirit of God, it's Paul. What does walking in God's will look like? And sometimes, I showed the kids, you guys maybe seen the, uh, the famous statue of the thinker, like this, right? And if Paul had been like the thinker, he wouldn't have gone anywhere until he knew exactly where God wanted him to go. And I thought, when we're analysis paralysis, or sometimes we could say praying for God's will paralysis, until I know exactly what God's perfect will is, I will go nowhere, God. If Paul had thought that way, he would never have made it out of Antioch. Because Paul has, you can't, Brother Stephen, you told me a long time ago, God can't steer a stationary ship. Uh, the rudder only works the ship's moving. Once Paul starts moving, God can, I had the kid get up and Gideon get up just a minute. If you're willing to start taking steps, just take some steps. It's easy to turn your one way to the other if you're taking steps. But if you say, I'm not going to go anywhere, Brother Rapp, until I know exactly what God wants me to do. And he just stands says, and I have to really push, push. Until I know, ex- you don't know where I'm pushing you yet. So you're, I'm not going to go anywhere until I know exactly where I'm supposed to go. I'm going to push, push, push. I really have to push you to know what God's will is. That's, we don't want to have that kind of relationship with our, with our prayer life. Thank you. But... Paul did not have a good day in Philippi. Yes, there was deliverance from demons. But then there was a deliverance of a jailer. But I thought, man, I try to avoid jailers. I try to avoid policemen. Paul did not have a good experience with the the jailer. He got whipped. He got beat. It was not a pain-free day. But it was a good day in God's eyes. Why does God treat his missionary like that? God could have done this much more easily because when God gives us a good day, it's not a pain-free day. Lord, please bless tomorrow. <laughs> uh, but he does give us a pain-free day, but he's building something inside of us. And the devil wants to do everything he can to alleviate the pain, alleviate the affliction, but that is not how God works. Take a look at 1 Peter chapter 1, and this is not in the slides. 1 Peter chapter 1. I want to notice a couple words that go together. Hebrews, James, 1 Peter. 1 and verse, uh, um, verse, uh, verse 5. We are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations, if need be. So if we're in heaviness through manifold temptations, it's because God determined that there was need. God doesn't waste those things. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Trial is paired with glory honor, and praise. Verse 11. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified before him the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Sufferings and glory are inseparably linked. Romans 8.18 For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And the sufferings, is that's one of those words on Satan's TV station that gets censored out. He's preaching about suffering. No, we don't, we don't hear that. Because that's what, that, that is what this, that's what this age is wretched. Because they have everything else to cover up the sufferings. The cover up the affliction so we don't feel it, so we feel better about it. But inside, it's not being dealt with, and it's still there, which is why they go from one thing to another thing to another thing. Hebrews chapter 2. And verses 9 and 10. But we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. 
For it became him, for for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, and bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. If that was the way our Lord had to walk, we can walk that way too. And we look at the promise that's given to the bride of the Laodicean age, that they will sit with him in that throne. They'll walk a path similar to his path to get there. You can't have that glory without the sufferings that are connected with it. So Satan does everything he can to keep us from the affliction. And when we're in affliction, he does everything he can to prevent us from understanding and valuing its purpose. If we're in a trial, we try to get out of that trial as fast as we can. But really, when we're in a trial, we we need to realize we are in God's hands. And we just want to stay there for as long as it takes. I can remember one time I was thinking that James chapter 1 talks about let patience have its perfect work, that you may be holy and entire, wanting nothing. I can just remember the image that God gave me was somebody in open heart surgery on the operating table, and he's tired of the surgery. He wants to jump off before the doctor's done with him. That's us. We're trying to jump out of our trial before God's done with us. We want God to, he will complete the surgery. He will take care of us. Take care of us through the trial as well will be accomplished in the trial. We will just wait and have that patience on him. Amen. It's not fun, but the glory is great. It's worth it. Next part of the prescription is uh, buy white raiment that we might be clothed. And that white raiment, we'll find that is the righteousness of, of um, the saints. If you look over in Revelation 19, 7 and 8, this is looking forward to the bride of Christ and the marriage of the Lamb. Verse 8 says, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And we don't have our own righteousness. Philippians 3, 9 says, We want to be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that righteousness which is of the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. So here, we, when we repent, we're done with our own works. We put all, the, and the Laodicean church is characterized by their own works. I know your works. They're glorying in their own works. But a true Christian doesn't glory in our own works. We glory in Christ's work. And that's one thing this talking church talks nothing about. They're not talking about the Christ work, but that is all that we can sing about. Because we, haven't, we don't have our own righteousness. We don't want our own righteousness. Our best days, our best acts are like trying to clean a dish with a dirty dish rag. It, our, our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Romans chapter 4, talking about Abraham. To him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. The Laodicean church was working a lot. But we've got such a huge, we we talked at Youth Retreat about credit. We've got such a huge debt, and Satan charges lots of interest. We can work as hard as we can, but we will never pay that off. The only way to get it paid off is to have faith in our millionaire God, billionaire God, who can settle all those accounts want perfectly. But to him that worketh not... But believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. The legacy in church was not acknowledged for their faith, but for their works. And works leads to debt. We want to have the faith of Christ. In the, in the, in the church age book, Brother Branham says about those, those, those white garments, there is a price to pay for those garments. And that is the price of separation. In order to because we have to buy of him. Where is he? He's on the other side of the church door because he's been kicked out. So if we have to buy of him, we have to be willing to separate from this group that we're with. We have to be willing to go to him and put our trust in him and be, hey, Lord, I've done all kinds of things. I thought I was doing good, but I don't want my... I see this is, this is terrible. These great things I thought were so super, it's terrible. Would you, can I trade them with you, Lord? I will give you all of mine, and you can give me yours. That's what, that's what repentance is about. And uh, uh, Paul talks about you can't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 
What concord hath Christ with Belial? What part hath the believer with an infidel? And this is where he says, in 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 17, uh, so verse 16, the top of page 5. What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? You are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God. They shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. There is a price for these garments. It's the price of separation. We have to leave this established Laodicean church and go to where Christ is. Then lastly, he says, anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. Because otherwise, you can't see. You can think you see, but you are not seeing what is true. And Brother Brandon points out, he does not say you have to buy this eye salve. No, because there's no price tag on the Holy Spirit. But without the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you can never have your eyes opened to a true spiritual revelation of the word. A man without the spirit is blind to God and his truth. And one comparison I have is uh, you can try to work on a jigsaw puzzle. But if you don't have the, the picture, you can try as hard as you can to put these pieces together. And you'll achieve some limited success by grouping colors together. You'll be able to put some just by hard study and hard work. But when you have that picture, that revelation from God, what it's supposed to be like, and then, then it can come together. But without that, you can be working and working and working, and you can be really proud of the few pieces you've put together. When you've got the picture, wow, it's so much easier. You know, there have been, Brother Branham says, you know, there have been some awful cold drafts blowing on the church in this generation. And I'm afraid her eyes have sort of frozen shut and she's blind to what God's done for you. He was talking about how up in the log cabin, his, his eyes be matted shut in the morning. My mom has to get the coon grease to get them out, to get, to get them open back up again. And the church needs some hot oil of the Spirit of God to open her eyes. Unless she receives the Spirit of God, she will go on substituting program for power and creed for word. Because the programs look great. The special effects look great. But that is no substitute for the power of God. The creeds can be very eloquent, can seem to cover every single logical position possible, but God is above all of that, and we can't substitute creed for word. Again, God sent us, he did not send us a theologian, he didn't send us books with footnotes, he sent us a prophet, and we should be really thankful for that. Again, without having our eyes anointed with eyes have, we'll count numbers for success rather than look for fruit. All of this, looking for true gold, getting the, that white raiment, anointing your eyes with ISAF. I, I love the sim symbolism because it, it enriches our, our vision of what repentance is. The next, the next part of it is, hey, in some, be zealous, therefore, and repent. That's He's getting right down to it. It's not easy to repent. It takes some... Uh, it takes the Holy Spirit to even help us to see that we, there's something to be repented from. Because whatever we've grown up doing, that is for us normal. And normal is usually connected with being good. Why would I want to do something different? This is normal. But then when the gospel comes, then, I say, oh wow, this, the way I've been seeing things isn't as good as I thought it was. This is how, as sinners, we grew up looking at the world. And we think, this is normal. This is the way the world is. This is how we see it. And any attempt to, to tell us the contrary, like, you know, you've got it turned the wrong way, you're looking at it the wrong way. That's, that's how we've always seen it. But repentance has to do with being, you're going one direction, and then you are being turned and going the other direction. But there's also a lot of turning in us. We need to be turned around and our whole mind gets turned around so that we can actually see things as they are. That's because repentance turned to us around, but there's a gradual turning around of the Holy Spirit working with us through the process of sanctification. There's a metamorphosis of our hearts and our minds. That's a continuing work of the Holy Spirit. When, uh, when Paul was, pre he, he went from Philippi, went down to Thessalonica, and he was not greeted with open arms after the first couple weeks. 
Uh, one, of his, the, one of the new believers, Jason, had the magistrates pounding on his door because people were accusing him. These are the people, they believe that these guys, they've turned our world upside down. Actually, the gospel turns your world right side up. Because we didn't realize how we were looking at things, everything was upside down. The gospel comes and turns it right side up. There we, there we had that. But the people de- battling diagnoses, dueling diagnoses, different visions of the world, no, that's wrong. No, this is right. But we've got to be willing to listen. And take a look at what repentance is. God is, God is calling for repentance. It says, Acts 3.19, Repent ye therefore, be turned around, and be converted. That change, that we're turning directions, our, our, our direction completely changes, and we are also completely changed. Our sins get blotted out. Times of refreshing will come from the presence of the Lord. And then um, Revela- uh, sorry, Romans chapter 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of your mind, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And this is something that we can do daily, but there's also an act of repentance here. We're, presenting, we're, we're surrendering ourselves to God. But I love verse 2. Be not conformed to this world. Don't let the world push you into its mold. But be, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And this is a, a metamorphosis that happens. It doesn't happen right at the altar. It starts there. But then there's a sanctification where God is changing us changing us because our whole mental world our whole picture of the world has been wrong we don't re- when we repent we don't realize how wrong we viewed the world there are so many things that we just kind of have hanging on because it's what we think is normal but we're willing to lay everything down and says god tell me how to think tell me how, what it really means to look at the world the right side up because we have no idea. Repentance includes all of that. It's not just. The first step is turning around, changing direction. That can happen in an altar. That can happen in your car, wherever God's moving you. But you, you turn around, change direction, and you continually walk with him, and you're being changed into his image. Everything about your mind, your heart, your affections, all these things are being gradually changed. It doesn't all happen at one moment. Some things, remember Brother Lonnie telling me, it can be like this big meat cleaver that says, one day I was smoking, the next day I wasn't, it was gone. But there can be other things that hang on for a long time. We battle, battle, battle. And as we keep on renewing our mind with God's word, those other tastes will gradually change and pass away. Amen. When we look at this loud to say an age, that's having this battle with the doctor, disagreeing with everything that God's saying about them, it doesn't look very hopeful for them. It's a really a far cry from the glorious church that we see described in Acts chapter 2 throughout the book of Acts. Much, much different. Um, and really, if you look at the arc of the church ages, it seems that Satan and the false vine have really had their way. It seems like that. Even after the Reformation, Sardis, and the great missionary age in Philadelphia. Like, my, it has to end like this? It looks like Satan is able to, to keep the upper hand, uh, uh, upper hand and squelch the revival. It seems hopeless. And here's where we have to point ourselves back to the attributes that God draws our attention to at the very beginning in Revelation chapter 3, because we've, we've spoken throughout how well, the attributes that God emphasizes as he introduces himself that has significance for the age. To so draw attention to this kind of as we kind of wind things down. These things saith the Amen. That's an attribute of God. The faithful and true witness. That's an attribute of God. The beginning of the creation of God. God is saying each one of these things for a purpose. The amen, God has the last word. It looks like, and this led to say in message, that looks like the Satan's ending with the upper hand and God's church is just broken and spilled out, worthless. But God has the last word. 
he will, he will win the argument. The devil, will not, the devil won't have anything to say when God's done. We can apply that to the church age. We can apply that also to our daily life and the trials that we face. We can, it seems like the trial we're in is endless. It's never going to get better. We can get so down and discouraged. God has the last word. Satan never has the last word in our trials. God is the amen. Satan might try to inject himself into the story, but God has the pen to finish the story. And a lot can happen in one or two pages. And God makes sure the story of your life, your children's life, that he will bring that to the end because God does not start something and leave it half-baked. Being confident of this very thing, he which hath begun a good work in you will be faithful and will to perform it to the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. He's also faithful and true. When Paul writes in Ephesians 5 about the, about the bride of Christ, who is uh, who's without spot, has, has no spot, wrinkle, any such thing, Paul is describing, but he's also speaking prophetically. He's, he's, he's writing here in the, book of, in the time of the book of Acts to the Ephesian, to, to the church of Ephesus. But these words are prophetic. Over the ages, there is going to be a bride of Christ. She doesn't have spot or wrinkle or any such thing. It's, she's going to be there. Amen. And Christ is faithful and true. I said this. I'll be faithful to perform it. And you can connect this attribute of faithful and true here in Revelation chapter 3. It comes up another time in Revelation chapter 19 when it says, He that is faithful and true is on this white horse. And he's in righteousness. He doth judge and make war. And the, and the bride comes down out of heaven with him. And they defeat the enemies of Israel. And they, and they, and they, they come and defeat the devil at the, at the, at the, there at the battle of Gog and Magog, I, I believe. But this is that. What God said it, he is faithful and true, he will perform it. That's an attribute of God that we can take much, much consolation from now. And he's the beginning of the creation of God. The beginning is always full of promise. And again, it appears Satan has successfully blocked out light and smothered revival. But God's word and God's nature remove that as a possibility. He's the beginning of the creation of God, which means he will not be alone. There will be other sons and daughters of God who will come along because he is just the beginning. A restoration is promised. Uh, let's go back to Revelation chapter 3. So verse 19, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Again, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh, that means there's going to be an overcomer. Will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. When the church ages begin, it's just like Jesus Christ, he died on the cross. He was resurrected and he says, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and, and die, it abides alone. That's why I have to give my life. If I don't, I, I would abide alone. And the church goes through the same cycle. Amen. They're in the church ages. That corn of wheat is planted in the Ephesian church age. And then gradually it, it dies. It seems to die throughout the ages. And that's the miracle of it. Amen. Satan thinks, if I can just kill it, I'll win. No, he's actually contributing to the seed's success. So he, he tries to kill it. The seed dies in the ground. And then it's a little radical sprouts forth. The first little root goes out. And gradually, this is what starts at Ephesus. And it seems like, at the end of the church ages, you've got something like the stump. And you can look at it, man, you can ask, can this tree live again? Is that even possible? And this is what the Jews would have thought after Malachi. There were a few faithful Jews there in the days of Zacharias and Elizabeth and Mary and Joseph. There were a few faithful ones who were looking for a Redeemer and Messiah to come. The other ones, it had been pretty tough. What Babylon had left, Persia had eaten up. 
what Persia had left, the Greeks ate up, what the Greeks left, the Romans ate up. There wasn't much hope for Messiah anymore. And people would be looking, my, that's the great promise that was left. Can this tree ever live again? And what Joel spoke applied to them. That which the palmer worm hath left, that's the locust eaten. What the locust hath left, the canker worm is eaten. What the canker worm hath left, the caterpillar is eaten. There's nothing left. The forces of Antichrist have laid my vine waste, barked my fig tree, laid it clean bare, casted away the branches that are ever made white. It looks hopeless. That's how it would have looked in that century before Christ was born. But there was a prophecy. Isaiah 11 says, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. And it looked like a hopeless case, but a shoot came out of that. I never knew that could happen. Years back, I was trying to clean up my backyard in Holland, and I borrowed, I got this chainsaw, I, I, I took some brush out, took it down to the stump, and man, I did good work. And then spring came, and I'm getting ready to bike to work, I look back, hold up! Everything is sprouting from these stumps. I thought I took care of it. No, you can think it, but there's still life there. And that's what just awakened me. The devil can think he's chopped us off. There's nothing left. But as long as there's still connection to that seed and to that root, there's life there. And there was a root, that, a, a shoot that came from the stump of Jesse, a branch from his roots. That was Christ. But the same cycle that happened with Christ happened at the end of the church ages also because those prophecies of Joel what the palmer worm with left, the canker worm eaten, what the canker worm left at the locust eaten. That's just the, the, the spirit of Antichrist, the horse riders going through, trying to kill away, kill away, kill away. They did that to the church ages, and it looked like it was so successful. But the promise was, I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm hath eaten. This was fulfilled in the days of Jesus, in the days of Peter. It was also fulfilled at the day of Pentecost in 1906 when the Pentecostal blessing came down. And he's been continuing to restore even the word to us because that's what was promised. Matthew 17, 11 says, Eli Jesus says, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. And he wasn't speaking of John the Baptist because John the Baptist was in no wise a restorer. He was a preparer. Jesus is speaking about the second fulfillment of Malachi 4, where it says, I will send you, Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Amen. He'll turn the heart of the fathers to the children. That's what John the Baptist ministry was doing, because the children of Israel were coming and were believing at Christ's feet. And the fathers of Israel, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, Saul was one of them. Saul had his heart turned see what the young church of, church of Israel was, was believing. The father's heart was turned to the children, to John the Baptist's ministry, to the, to the disciples' ministry. But at the end time, the heart of the children will be turned back to the apostolic fathers. And that is what we had in the Elijah the prophet ministry prophesied for in these last days. And that is what the angel of the church of Laodicea does. These then, just look at the work of restoration that can be done. The stump looks like a picture of hopelessness, but there's a lot of life there under that stump. And this, this, this ministry of repentance first, showing us what real repentance looks like, that's what makes restoration possible. Because if a church is unwilling to repent, if we as individuals are unwilling to repent, how can we ever sit in Christ's throne? We can't. We repent. We follow the word of restoration. The only way that we can sit in Christ's throne with him is in, like in verse 22, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. But if like this patient who's listening to the doctor with his fingers in his ears, he's not hearing what the doctor's saying to him. We have to have our ears open to hear what God is speaking to us so that we can have a heart to repent a heart to change so that our mind can be transformed. Because you know what? The media today was constantly working to turn that map back around. And without the Spirit of God, it's going to tend to go back, 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 back. Before we realize it, we'll be raising our hands in church on Sundays and thinking like heathens throughout the week. So we let be transformed continually by the renewing of your mind. That is a continual process. We can never say we've arrived. Continue to transform me. Amen.
And we have this promise of overcomer because this is a restoration. This is paving the way for us to be restored back to the same dominion that Adam and Eve had there in the Garden of Eden because we will have the same authority as the, as the King of Kings has sitting with him there in the throne. And then I'm going to end with, I want to read this last paragraph from the uh, Church Age book and then we'll be finished for this evening. I think this is, Brother Brandon expresses really clearly what the purpose of his ministry is. He says, Not for one moment do I bring a message to the people that they may follow me or join my church or start some fellowship and organization. I have never done that and will not do that now. I have no interest in those things, but I do have an interest in the things of God and people. Because if you love God, you love people too. And if I can accomplish just one thing, I will be satisfied. What's that one thing? That one thing is to see established a true spiritual relationship between God and men, wherein men become new creations in Christ, filled with his spirit, and live according to his word. That's the one thing. Lord, may we have a true relationship, a true spiritual, not a true works relationship, but a true spiritual relationship between, with, with the Lord. He says, I would invite plead and warn all to hear his voice at this time and yield your lives completely to him, even as I trust in my heart that I have given my all to him. God bless you and may his coming rejoice your heart. And it does. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for your goodness and your grace to us, Father. And just as we spent last uh, service in this one looking at the conditions of the church age that surrounds us, Father. I'm even more thankful than ever before that there has been a message to call us out. Thank you, Lord, for showing us so vividly what repentance looks like. It can be so easy to get our eyes on the wrong things and and start valuing the gold that is hawked on Amazon, the gold that's hawked at the stores, and and we want those kinds of things. But Lord, I pray that you would help us to have that value even for the trials that you put into us, we may have real gold, Christ-like character, bought, by, bought in the furnace of affliction, Lord. Father, I pray that you would encourage each one. Lord, I pray for those who are still sick at home, Father, that you would raise them up. Lord, I just pray that you would bless us, even as these, in these end times that can be so deceiving, Lord. I pray that you would help us to keep our ears open, that we may hear what the Spirit is continuing to say to the churches. Oh, God, draw us close to you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Thank you, Brother Rapp. Appreciate the teaching. Praise the Lord. Well, I just say, Jesus, help us. Amen. And he has come. And, and as much as we rejoice in the, at the end there, the promise of restoration in an age so bad, we rejoice in that because we're part of that too by God's grace. We still take the rebuke. You know, it's such a strong rebuke to think that we're in a time that... As Brother Rapp said there, the last few words that we could be raising our chair in church on Sunday and living like a heathen the rest of the week. It's only in this age that Satan allows people and leads people to live that way. Live like a heathen through the week and raise your hand and worship on Sunday. We don't want to be living that way. And so I thought it was really neat. He said this age is a real battle with the doctor. It's a battle with the doctor because only Dr. Jesus can diagnose us perfectly. And um, it's, I was, it's kind of funny how people do go, I was talking to my daughter this week about this, the lack of trust sometimes, and you know, they call it a practice, so they're practicing on you. And so, but people argue all times with a, with a doctor and such, but this is Dr. Jesus, and he's the only one qualified to diagnose this age. And we might as well make it to the individual. He's the only one qualified to diagnose your spiritual life. You don't diagnose it yourself, because if you do, you're going to come out smelling like a rose. But thank God for a doctor, like a mechanic or a good mechanic. They're going to tell you the truth. They're going to tell you the truth. I don't like a mechanic that is giving me stuff I need to do in my car that don't really need to be done. But then he's hiding other things as well. I like like him to shoot straight. I like a doctor to shoot straight. And Dr. Jesus shot straight with this Laodicean age. He diagnosed it. It was rough words. It was straight words. And they didn't want to hear it for the most part. 
but I'd rather trust Dr. Jesus' diagnosis than my own or a denomination or my family's. I'd rather trust his diagnosis because in the end, this doctor is going to help us get out. And uh, so I wanted to say uh, tonight we come to the end of this series and it's been such a joy to enjoy this study for the last year and a half. I wanted Brother Rapp to uh, to, to bring it out. We can get some good videos of it because I know not only want it for the believers here and wh whoever else you want to refer to it, if they want to settle down and study. You see, the thing is, is that the church ages, we're, we're at the end. We're at the very end. So now we're looking back to 2,000 years since Christianity began. And you all have learned that right after Christianity began, the Antichrist spirit come in. To, to duplicate, or excuse me, not duplicate, but to try to impersonate. So, so now at the end, um, those, those who lived during those ages that were believers were anointed to overcome that age. They were given an anointing to overcome whatever the Antichrist spirit was doing. But they didn't know what was going on. You see, they didn't really know the diagnosis. They didn't really know it. Was, they just had the anointing to overcome it. And sometimes we're that way. We don't really have all the answers, but... If we're the, under the anointing, we're going to overcome. But the benefit of the last age with the seventh angel, he will go back now and diagnose not just the seventh church age, but he'll look into all that and say, this is what was happening in Ephesians. This is what was it. We're really blessed because those saints didn't get to see that. But now at the end, the seventh angel takes us through this process as this is what was happening, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos for 2,000 years. And then he gets to the last one. And so we're really blessed in this time under the seventh angel and under ministers and teachers like this to break this down. But, and so if you're interested, if you're interested, I wanted to have it. You can get a church age book in the library. I want to make this available eventually on YouTube that anybody that you witness to that's a serious Bible studier of the eight, last 2,000 years, they can go to that and they can, they can, they can, we can send them a church age book. You can have one in the library. You can get a church age book. You can sit down. If it takes you another two years to study, you can take this piece, piece by piece. If you're a serious Bible studier, and you can, you'll have, you'll be able to download these notes from Brother Rapp. And you'll be able to watch the videos and take your time and study it right off of YouTube. And I wanted that. And now it's completed tonight. And I say, praise the Lord. We've got something because I believe, and I'm not to build up, I'm not building up Brother Rap, but I do really appreciate because I think he's really broke this down uh, very well uh, through the gift that God has given him. And it's very easy to understand and very uh, much in line with what the seventh angel brought us. And so it's very good. And it's completed tonight. Um, and so we appreciate it and we want to say thank you for the labors in the word the last year and a half of all the study hours that Brother Rapp has gone through to do this. Thank you, Brother Rapp. Amen. Um, he mentioned tonight he's been coming here seven years now and this church has benefited from uh, his gift growing in this way. Um, do you want to take the seven seals now and go through them? <laughs> We're talking about it. Um, but, you know, uh, he's grown so much in his gift, and we have brought the benefit here as, and also other places that's listening in. Uh, and his family has grown his, his, in, in, in the Lord. And so it's been a good thing for us, and it's a good big thing for them. So we thank the Lord for what he's done. So I'll say it again. We'll have this now. If those who are listening in charge of the technical stuff, let's get all these notes on the YouTube so that when you go to YouTube, you can listen to Brother Rap. You can take your church age book. You've got the notes here that I've enjoyed going through each Wednesday that he preaches it. But these are great notes with all the scriptures. And uh, also you have the PowerPoints on there as well. So let's get that done as well. So you got about four sources there as you study it. The PowerPoints he's using, and he had a lot of really good ones. The notes and everything you could just really settle down and study it and go back over it again. So I think that's good. Amen. Let's stand together. Gideon will sing a few songs. And I thank the Lord for his healing to the body of Christ. There's many still recovering and coming back out of it. But I think we're on the other end of this. And uh, so we appreciate you uh, listening in tonight. Want to say happy birthday. Uh, I don't think she's here. I think she's listening in. Sister Jennifer Jorabessa's birthday is today. God bless you. Happy birthday, Sister Jennifer. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Thank <laughs> you.
So this weekend, I wanted to share with you a couple things. We have um, Saturday on the back is a night of worship at Brother Sam Browning's church. I can't remember the time. I think it's four or five o'clock. And there's a flyer back there with the address. And so that's a nice singing going on if you want to attend that. And then he has Brother Trevor Inman Sunday morning. And then Sunday afternoon is youth meeting there. We encourage our young people, if you're not doing anything, to drive over. I've heard hearing good things about Trevor Inman, Brother Trevor Inman. Really a good minister for the youth. So that is Sunday night at Brother Sam's and then a singing Saturday. Brother Josiah will speak this Sunday uh, for about the last probably 10 years. A uh, precious pastor up here, Brother John Martin, has asked me to come a Sunday and to speak for them. And so I think it's been 10 years he's asked for a, uh, or more that he's asked for a Sunday. So I feel led of the Lord to go and help that group and just in whatever way I can. So this uh, weekend, Brother Josiah will minister here uh, at home. Praise the Lord. I think that's all the announcements. Let's continue to pray for one another. And then, Lord willing, since we finish this series, next Wednesday night we will be uh, back in the back room by the fire, fireside midweek service, and uh, we'll have it synagogue style and gather and uh, have our teaching back there for the winter Wednesday nights. Praise the Lord. God is good. Amen. Come on, Brother Gideon. And I'll just say a word of prayer in closing, and then he can sing a couple of courses and close the service tonight. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we are humbled to hear these things. And we are blessed to live at the last age because now our eyes have been opened to look back and see all the traps of the enemy, all the, the exposing the two vines, the false church, the true church, both claiming Christ. We're just so blessed that our eyes see this. And Lord, the result and fruit should be that we not live in this age in a lukewarm state that we'd live uh, through the week as a, as, as a heathen and then try to be, but we would not live that way, not be lukewarm, not cold nor hot, but Lord, that we would ask you to just burn those holy fires within us and let us be on fire for you. Let us be uh, just passionate for you. When we make a mistake that we quickly repent of it, Lord. Repentance is the way out of Laodicea. Uh, the cry of the bride is I'm wrong. Lord, you're right and we're wrong. We humbly say we're wrong and you're right. And may we find true repentance that's not just an exercise upon our lips, but may we find it a change in our hearts that we this diagnosis, we would not stay in this state of wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, but we could be redeemed and, and rise above it, Lord, and be called one of those overcomers to the Laodicean age. And I think of the song that Sherry wrote, my sister Sherry wrote, that when we get on the other side someday and others gather around us who came from this age and they say, are you she, the bride of the last days, who stood such temptation and such lukewarmness and yet there was some overcomers. Lord, I want to be one of them. I want to be one of those that escaped this age. Help me and give me more of the Holy Spirit. Give me more repentant heart. Give me a humble heart, Lord, that I could be one of those that would be escaped of Israel. That beautiful branch in the last days. Mold me into that, Father. Whatever you have to do, mold me into it. And tonight we learn, Lord, that our trials are the gold that we need to seek after. Not riches of this life. Not to be a big church. Not to be a, a well-known, famous church not to seek for numbers, but Lord, the pouring out of your Holy Ghost upon the people, salvation, Holy Ghost, redemption, deliverance, oh God. Come in our midst, Father, come in our midst. Pour your spirit through this place, Lord. May hearts be convicted, Father, for this is the very last hours of time. We can't be Laodiceans. We must be believers on fire for you. I humbly ask, Lord, that you forgive me and that we would lift above the, the spirit of this age. We thank you, Father. May conviction always be a part of our hearts, not condemnation, but true conviction. And Lord, we commit this series to you, Brother Rapp has brought. And may I pray you'll prosper it, Lord, that it would go to many ears and many hearts, unbelievers, many people we wouldn't expect. May it reach out. 
Lord, as Brother Rapp was saying, he was witnessing to people and directing them to the YouTube so they could go and listen to the church. Lord, may you reach out and use it to not just minister to us, but many others who need to hear what you've done throughout the ages. And that son of man standing in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Reveal yourself to them, Lord, I pray. And we thank you, Father, so much. Continue to heal the sickness in our body. Lord, so, so many have been through it. I pray you'll continue to bring restoration and healing to every child and every home by the power of your healing. In the name of Jesus Christ, we ask it. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Mm, nothing else matters. Nothing in this world will do. Jesus, you're the center. Everything revolves around you. Oh, Jesus, you nothing, nothing else matters. Nothing in this world will do. Jesus, you're the center. Everything revolves around you. Jesus, you. Oh, Jesus at the center of it all. Oh, Jesus at the center of it all from beginning to the end it will always be it's always been you Jesus oh gee nothing else nothing else matters center of my life. Oh, Jesus, be the center of my life. Oh, from beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Only you, Lord. Oh,
Oh. Uh-huh. 